Welcome everybody to another session um, of education webinar and today is actually a very very special session we've been waiting for this session for a week so I'm really excited to present so uh, I would like to just introduce um, myself a little bit so um, as you uh, know this webinar will be presented by Asaf uh, Nassim who is the founder of um, Capital 101. She holds a master's in architecture from the University of Glasgow and is a lead green associate and she also trained in entrepreneurship and innovation program at um, Northern Eastern University. Asaf also volunteers in her spare time at the British Red Cross as a moderator for the Toronto Society uh, of Arch uh, Architects. Um, Asaf is also an ambassador for women in construction. He having, having lived in four different countries and traveling extensively across the world, she has been exposed to vast range of environments and cultures. Asaf is empowered by learning from people from all walks of life, and she enjoys striking up conversations with strangers, which she finds is the best way to get exposed to unique ideas. Welcome, Asaf. We're very glad to have you here today, and um, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Lamia, for the introduction, and thank you to Educational Webinar Jam for hosting this presentation today, uh, and to all the audiences joining from all over the world. Uh, I'll just jump right into it, and at first I'll ask the audience a question, and I'd like you to tell me what are norms to you, and I'll do this through an example. I've got four pictures here on the left of traffic signals which allow pedestrians to cross the road. I would like to ask you which one of these numbers do you think means go? It could be one or two of the options or one of them. I'd like the audience to engage and let me know in comments what they think. I can see someone commented one. Yep. How about Rami, what do you think? I see you raising your hand. Good morning, Afafan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm thinking one, two, and four. Okay. Think a combination of them. Okay. Well, I can see that we have some mix and match of answers. It's actually a trick question. All of them mean go. And what I'm trying to imply by that is that norms for you could be different than what other people think. Um, all of these are meant to tell you how do pedestrians cross the road and when they can cross the road. So whether the signal goes green, whether there's a white walking man, or even if there's a hand up, because there's a little timer at the bottom, which actually tells you that's how much time you have left to cross the road. So it may be different across all the parts of the world, but it's all to use it for one same common denominator, which is just across the road. And that just goes to show, you know, norm for you could be different for someone else halfway across the world. And now I'd like to see, you know, what do you think divergence means? You know, please feel free to open up your mic and let me know, but also in the chat box, you can comment what you think divergence means to you. We'll just wait a few minutes for responses and I'd love the audience to engage and see what they think they mean, what that divergence means. Um, I would like to, you know, take a guess sure. at divergence. I think um, leading to different ways, I think uh, perhaps like from the verb divert to divert from a specific goal, like to take a different route, could be, I mean, that's just my guess. Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else would like to, um, you know, tell us? 
maybe branch out? Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, I, I think it also means that uh, it also it, um, it like Remy said, uh, it branches out, but it also comes from one single point, and then mm -hmm. the collective point is something that is common to all of us. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for your answers. I think all of you are right in one way or the other. That's why divergence is pretty much a broad term. And I've got a word cloud here, which indicates a few different ideas on how divergence uh, could be changed or moved around in terms of what it means. Uh, we've got a few words which say, you know, evolve, uh, paradigm shift, and taking your leap. Uh, but also, it could be about disrupting things. So somebody was talking about, you know, moving away from a certain direction. It could be adaptation or diverging. I think when we were saying, you know, coming from the word diverging. Um, and so it's all about the idea that you potentially be moving away from doing one thing or the other a certain way. Um, and it also could mean that you have one common denominator of how you would do this. And then you're moving in a direction that would change that. So I've got one example here at first is the evolution of transportation. And you can see we all started off walking before we got carts to be moved by animals. Then they had big ships that were sailed across the world. Um, later on, tracks were being set to for trains to be going on land to different countries and different cities. Um, and of course, you had the invention of the cycle, then the car, and now we have big planes that get you across the world. You know, people went from traveling halfway across the world, which took them months in a ship to literally going in a couple of hours by jumping on a flight now. So you can see that over time, people diverged, diverged from modes of transportation, from simply walking or using uh, horses to carry carts, all the way now up to taking planes to go and travel across the world. And so when you look back at the word cloud, you know, you think about different words here, which uh, could be either uh, technology advancements. It could be how to maybe solve solutions, such as trying to get from one place to another faster. Uh, you know, revolutions of so the idea of the modes of transportation completely evolved over time. And people took, you know, leaps in science to also achieve a lot of these issues and how to overcome sort of uh, using wheels, using uh, engines to speed you along using different methods of either using coal for trains and now they're electric as well so over time things had changed and diverged but the common denominator was modes of transportation and now you see that even though we had several modes of transportation there's often the most popular ones so most people just use either uh, bikes cars or maybe a, a bus or public transport like trains or trams in their city, and then maybe once a year, once a couple of years to fly out to a different country or different destination. And so even though over time we had lots of modes of transportation, but now you don't see many carts being pulled by horses. So it, all, it is all part of the idea of diverging away from the modes of transportation to something that would be essentially changing the way we live and evolving and rethinking and how we do things. And now if you think about it, people are still continuing to question the way we transport things uh, and choosing sort of choices for sustainable options in terms of transportation. So people are saying, okay, we don't want to use that many cars because it causes carbon emission in the country. Uh, so can we provide more public transport that people can uh, use and get from point A to point B, either going to school or to work or just traveling around in the city? Um, to be a lot more sustainable. And then you start to think again, back to the word cloud, you know, people are again diverging, but by rethinking the modes of transportation, it's still the same, so it hasn't necessarily evolved, but rethinking, you know, which one should be prioritized or which one should we use more often uh, just to help the environment and be thinking about more sustainable choice. And now to give you a little bit of insight on what PAPIS 101 is all about. Um, PAPIS, if anyone doesn't know, 
is a little floret. So these are these white fuzzy bits that fly off dandelions. And you can see pictures of this on my background on the bottom right here and the top right. Um, and basically, they spread seeds all across their area. And they're really, really resilient because they're so small and so light, but they're pushed with wind in really rough circumstances. It could be snow, it could be raining, but they still persevere and go through with their seedlings and spread in, in spring to grow a new idea, uh, uh, sorry, a, a new plant over time. And so my idea of using Pappas is similar in spreading ideas for people to spread uh, sort of sustainable growth in the environment, but also inspire um, a better future for the next generations. So I'd like everyone to engage with Pappas as a way of spreading seeds of idea. Now with Pappas 101, it's also a think tank. What does that really mean? That means we are um, debating ideas, uh, doing consultations, and also researching different concepts. With think tanks, the most important aspect is that you do have real statistics and research to back your ideas. And because eventually that leads to having a better future um, through either policy change or uh, creating sustainable choices and, uh, and providing options that could create a paradigm shift and help people diverge from the norm, essentially. Um, but the most important thing is we're not just putting out comments to be like, you should do this without really telling you, you know, what is the real background and research and statistics to back that idea. And, you know, I've got a little notebook here on the left, which is a variety of different uh, ideas here, which kind of show, you know, what could be some of the topics that we'd be proposing at in a think tank. You know, it could be something as basic as, should we be eating cheese anymore because it produces a lot of carbon footprint in production? You know, is that something that we really need as a healthy human being to include in our diet if it's ruining the earth? Um, is there a more efficient way of producing green energy than windmills? You know, is there better solutions out there? Um, is there better ways to plant trees faster to help the environment to produce more oxygen in the air? Um, is there a better transportation solutions for bikes? You know, bikes are one of the greenest, friendliest uh, modes of transportation because they don't actually use any um, oil or any other sort of machinery to actually get you from point A to point B. Uh, but could, be, could there be something that would help you get there faster that doesn't require that much exercise? Um, also, the way we live, our homes, can we be more efficient and more sustainable uh, so it helps improve our environment, but also for the next generations to keep the planet going in a most healthy format. And part of that process is also for everyone like you who came in here today to engage with the think tank, to bring up their ideas and get involved. Um, it could be educators and researchers. Uh, the educators are sort of the backbone of every industry, I believe, because it all starts from you learning about things, science, math uh, at school, up to going to university and specializing in a certain field, of your choice, and researching further about, you know, what it means to be in your industry and what sort of topics or innovation ideas could come up in your sector. We also would consider professionals and specialists, and these could be anyone ranging from the business world to the tech world um, to medical professionals. You know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum. And essentially, everybody has something to add. And especially if you're a specialist in the field, it just implies that you know exactly what you're talking about and you know how you could be improving uh, things in your industry. And then, of course, designers and engineers. Designers and engineers, I believe, should work together to figure out solutions how to build something or a certain product, a certain way to live, or a certain sort of equipment that would be more efficient and sustainable based on some of the ideas that researchers have come up with. And also, of course, entrepreneurs and innovators. So this is, a, again, a broad, broad spectrum. You could be an artist trying to do something about urban interventions. You could be uh, simply a, a person who's trying to come up with an app to make life more efficient. And it's it's really like everybody who has a little bit of creativity and um, interest in improving and bringing something new to the environment.
And so you might be thinking, you know, how do you come up with these ideas? How can you think about new ways to do things? The first thing I would say is look at what you've been complaining about recently. Think about, you know, what has it been in your life that's affecting you in a negative way? You know, have you been complaining about something uh, at home, at work? Um, if you're a teacher, are your students complaining to you about something? Uh, if you're a pharmacist, are your patients uh, complaining about something that you find a common denominator in a lot of them? Um, you know, if you're an architect, is there something your clients are trying to tell you to do and you find it as a complaint and you don't want to deal with it? But, you know, it, is there elements that could be improved that you see around you that uh, that could be taken from complaints to solutions? So I'd like to open up the floor again to the audience. And if anybody would like to know, you know, what's the latest complaint you've been having? Either you've been complaining about it or somebody has been complaining to you about it. I'll give you guys a few minutes to maybe think about it, but I'm pretty sure that everybody has one complaint or the other. Okay, I can see uh, someone's raised their hand. Please feel free to. Yes. Um, recently, I've been complaining about the food quality. Yeah. In uh, the restaurants in our city, so. And so. What do you think the issue is in the food quality? Uh, they're not good enough, but I don't know why, because uh, I don't know, but I, I just heard these uh, complaints because uh, when I want to work and I want to buy something and eat, uh, it's really hard to get really good food around the around my workplace. So I would say I've been complaining about that. Okay. Well, thank you for letting us know. Um, anybody else, would you like to let us know what you've been complaining about recently or someone has been complaining to you about recently? You can freely open your mic or you can write your comment in the chat box. All right, Samina, go ahead. Maybe try to unmute. Samina, if you're here, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Anybody else? Would you like to let us know? Well, Rami, go ahead. Well, I, ha I have something. I'm not sure how to... Uh... If it, if it connects or not, but it's something that relates to communication. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm finding myself complaining about how sometimes um, unclear or fake uh, or untransparent communication doesn't allow things to really evolve and develop ideas to be really discussed. Um, I'm, I'm finding trouble with that and, and I've been finding myself complaining about that for a while in the last couple of months. And is that just like information, the way you would it or? Would you, would you mind saying that again? Is that based on like information, for example, news, or is it just like engaging with people? And engaging with, mainly engaging with people. Okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been teaching for years and I found that the more you are um, engaging and sincere and um, open both to your to, to others ideas but also open to just expressing your your own ideas the discussion evolves quicker however yeah. when those discussions become a bit more timid um, and, and 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 just don't go into the depth of the idea that level of fakeness doesn't allow the actual ideas to to come up and evolve okay uh i'm really glad you brought that up because through the presentation i'll tell you ideas of how you know you can actually evolve something and um and so it'll be really interesting if you if you see how it goes further on thank you rami and so that's one idea to think about you know what people have been complaining about another way to find inspiration is through the art of noticing and that means you know opening up your eyes and seeing what's around you 
So how many times have you actually just woken up and go past your window and not even look outside and what's happening? You know, do you actually look for two minutes outside your window and see, you know, what the environment is like? Or do you just look on your phone the minute you wake up to check what the weather is going to be like outside? You know, you want to see if it's raining, if it's sunny, if it's cloudy, if it's snowing, but you just want to check your phone on an app instead of looking outside and, you know, actually thinking uh, what could be uh, the weather. And um, things like that are small things where you can start to notice the environment around you to help you engage a little better and maybe come up with a better way. For example, how could you tell the forecast to someone? You know, is it something that you can look into outside? Is it instead of looking on a phone app? Um, other ways also to observe the environment around you is take a walk around your city. Um, try to think about exploring new places. So you might have a usual routine going from home to work or home to studying at a certain school or university. But, you know, think about taking a new route that day. Think about going in a different direction and how you could actually uh, see and explore what's around you. Maybe you find a new grocery store that's closer to where you, where you usually go just because you took a new route and you found that it was there. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, Googling on Google Maps to find the closest grocery store to you, but actually exploring your neighborhood and maybe even further afield going to a new city or a new country to explore how things are done in different areas. Um, but also by connecting with others. So a lot of you are here today trying to do something new. Uh, my platform is pretty vague. It doesn't say which industry it's about. And yet you're all trying to connect on a certain idea with other people here today. And, and that also gets you engaging and thinking about new ways and ideas to do things. So it might be about the way you learn what complaints could be helping you create new ideas or even, you know, what a think tank means, whether you engage or not, there's something new you learn today. And so once you think you have an idea, how do you go about and going forward with, you know, how to resolve a certain issue? So I've got the SAR method here, which means you identify what a situation is, what the action should be, and how the results could resolve that issue. So at first, if we think about what a situation is, and we go back to the traffic light, and we think, you know, pedestrians uh, all over the world need to be engaging with traffic lights uh, to find out when they need to cross the road. However, uh, traffic lights are more like built for cars. Uh, it's often humans versus, you know, machines because cars, trucks and vans are zooming past streets and you have to stop to ensure that you're able to cross the road easily by making sure that uh, you have either a green man, a walking man, or a hand sign with a timer that tells you, you know, how much time you've got left to cross the road. But if you're traveling to a new country and you're exploring a new area, you might not know that a white walking man means that you can actually cross the road. You might be waiting for the green line and, you know, the green light to come up. And with that lack of uniformity, it creates an issue for people walking on the street to figure out how they're going to cross the road if they can't find out, you know, when exactly it is that they need to cross the road. So norms become different for everyone, and that makes it harder for people to actually uh, engage in their environment. And so this pretty much creates inefficiencies in the way we uh, think about uh, transportation, because right now uh, traffic lights are primarily to stop cars and, to, of course, not bumping into each other on an intersection, but also then to stop cars to allow people to cross the road. So, but is that really the right way to think about it? And you have to think, you know, what are actions could be taken to improve that situation? So at first you should research and figure out the statistics of, you know, what's the most efficient way to do things. You should research how different areas do things differently. So I had four pictures of, uh, you know, pedestrian lights, which were completely different halfway across the world and everybody engaged in a different way. So, you have to find out, you know, how it's different in your area from another country or another city. And also then you start to set priorities to say like, is traffic lights really supposed to be for cars or for humans or pedestrians to cross? You know, uh, why is it that traffic lights are directed by cars? Why can't we press a button and for the cars to stop straight away and let people pass first? 
especially when we're thinking about sustainable choices and we're telling people to walk more and stop using uh, cars to reduce carbon footprint. So the priority, priority should be set to people as opposed to vehicles on the road. Um, a few countries are doing that, like Zurich, where they have uh, traffic lights, which are actually dictated by pedestrians. As soon as you press a button, it stops and changes uh, color so the cars can stop and they can cross. But this is not a universal idea. People um, in other parts of the country uh, don't work the same way. Um, in pla other places, cars are taking priority. So you should see, you know, are there any actions that you could do that, to create this idea universally adaptable? Uh, so everybody around the world could essentially be more efficient in the way they're uh, uh, allowing pedestrians to cross the road. And then you start to think about the result. You know, what impact does this have on people? Um, how can it improve their lives? How can uh, people start thinking about walking more if they feel safer on the road? If they feel they're able to actually cross the road without being hit by a truck? Um, one of the I would say the weirdest thing that I've seen is, um, for example, in Canada, even though you have pedestrian light, which is on, which allows pedestrians to cross, cars can still turn right, which means cars are still coming while you're walking. And that just shows, you know, it has an impact on me because I'm sometimes scared when this big truck's coming past my way. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get squashed right under a truck. Of course, they're stopping for you. Of course, there's rules in place, but still. A speeding car versus a slow pedestrian could be a very uh, tricky situation. Um, so it just impacts the way people engage with that traffic light, how people feel about walking on the road. Because to me, that doesn't feel very safe. I'd rather be in a car because, well, I don't want to get run over. And, and so if we're trying to promote that sort of change and sustainable choices, we have to think, how can we change the infrastructure to allow for that? And how it could be changed across the world as well. Um, so while one country does it better, why are other countries not having it uniform? Because when you think about cars, you think that they all have the same step. They have red, amber, and green. That's exactly the same all around the world. So why is it that pedestrians have to have different options and different, w and different ways it's done in different countries, but cars get something which is very much you know, uh, uniform across the world? So these are a few ideas on how you could go about one situation. So I just took, you know, pedestrian lights and you look at the SAR method and you go through it step by step and you start to see how that's what the situation is, identify what actions could be taken to improve the results and resolve that situation. And now I'd like to tell you a bit more about the process of what Pathos does to help you and guide you through different research or ideas. So at first, uh, we'd help you define the concept. So you may have an idea, which at first you just scribbled on a paper, and you might not know how to actually bring it forward and present that idea to someone in your industry. So we'll help you define that and try and figure out exactly what you're trying to achieve and really make a statement that will bring your idea clearly forward to others. Uh, then support you on the development of these ideas. This could be through networking with people within your industry, um, helping you figure out where you can find the right resources and information for that topic. And also, if there's any sort of support you need in terms of writing or researching, we'd be able to help you out with that. Next, we'll also help you and assist you in creating a prototype. So once you've got an idea, it'd be great to see in how it could be figured out or achieved in real life whether it be just you know a theory-based idea that could move forward towards someone else producing the prototype, or it's you yourself trying to figure out how you could create that step forward. Um, and, and seeing you know how you can maybe engage in finding different ways of doing that as well. There's so many different uh, technologies in the world right now, things like 3D printing, laser cutting, you know, it, it could be something quite specific to the medical industry, but it just ensuring that you'd have a way to find out how you could actually bring your idea forward. Uh, next, we'll also give you some advice on the implementation of that idea. So once you think you have a prototype ready and you want to bring it forward, you want to see how could you actually bring that idea to the world? You know, which target audience do you need? Uh, what companies do you need to be uh, selling this idea to? Or even if it's just for your personal use, 
you know, giving you some advice on how that prototype could be more efficient or maybe more user friendly or even more sustainable. And then finally, you'd be able to materialize the idea. We want to make the process as easy as possible for you and actually guide you through some of the complaints you've been having, some of the problems and the issues you've been thinking to then come up with solutions. And as soon as you start to break it down with someone, it makes it easier to actually go through the thinking process step by step to eventually materialize the idea or the concept. And so during that process, what we're doing is sort of helping you to achieve those ideas. So everyone has something to contribute. Uh, no matter what industry you come from, you may have one idea or the other or several ideas that you want to bring forward. And it doesn't matter if you're a teacher, an engineer, um, you're, you're a tech guy, uh, you're a student, you all, you all come up with ideas. So everybody has something to engage in, whether in their industry or even a different industry. Um, what's really interesting is when you start to seek different points of view from different industries. So I come from an architectural industry, but I'm happy to speak with someone who's in finance or tech to see what they're up to lately, because it's it just helps you produce some different concepts and ideas in the way you would live your life or change something that's happening around you. You know, we're used to using credit cards without really understanding, you know, what it means for someone to produce a credit card, or how do banks work? Um, and so someone who's very dedicated in finance knows exactly how that works. Uh, but as an architect, I'm still using that as well. You know, it, it, everything comes in, and works together. So it's important that you engage with people from different industries and different points of views to try and figure out, you know, how it is that you can help your idea to come forward. And often what's really uh, beneficial for me is to have a sounding board. So you might want to discuss your idea with someone because you might be stuck in a certain position or you don't know how to go forward with that. Um, so it's really just offering you a way for someone to get a fresh pair of eyes uh, to understand what you're talking about and does it make sense. And quite often, you know, it will start to make sense as soon as you start talking about it to someone because you're trying to convince them of your idea. So something that might be stuck in your head, as soon as you start uh, bringing it up and talking about it to someone, you might be, even as you go along, making up stuff through your thoughts, through your discussion, and that will help you achieve your idea or concept uh, in the end. And of course, uh, by doing this, we will be instilling sort of confidence and encouragement, you know, allowing you to be empowered by your concept and idea and bringing it forward to the world and thinking, you know, you can do this and you can bring that concept that's innovative uh, and uh, bring that out to the world that would just help people overall. You know, it might be certainly for something for the environment. It could be something that just helps your students. It could be something that's uh, helping your industry. So it could be a variety of things, but we just want to make sure that you think you can do it and you can achieve it. And so with that, I would like you to uh, launch your ideas and invite you to join Papas 101. And you can scan the QR code or go to the website. And essentially what that means is you get to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with myself or someone with the team uh, to get some thoughts on your ideas. Um, and as a special offer today, whoever came to the audience uh, gets a free session with us. And so in the comments, just let us know you joined today. And so we'll be happy to have that one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one session with you uh, for your initial discussion of presenting your ideas and concepts. And I encourage everyone from every industry uh, to join us. And it's, it's not limited to one field, uh, a certain type of job, a certain type of profession. You could even be a student. You're not even a professional yet. If you have an idea, let's bring it forward. Let's have a discussion and see what that could be like. And so if you think you still don't have an idea, but you'd still like to see what we're up to, I would encourage you to connect with us on LinkedIn. And then you can see how others are bringing their ideas forward and maybe gain some inspiration and engage with people. You know, we might put up posts to be, um, you know, we've got someone with a new idea who's still coming up with some options on how to develop something. And we encourage audience to engage with us and let us know in comments what they think about, you know, this concept or idea or how they think it could be improved. And it might be, you know, one, one specific comment from someone that might help the innovator to click and 
push through an issue they're having. So, you know, it's not necessarily about just um, bringing ideas forward, but it's also about people engaging with others from every industry and from every sector to help each other out and essentially help everyone else around the world because their idea might be, you know, breaking green energy or it might be a way that's improving your life, but you just don't know how yet. And so thank you for your time. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Ataf. Honestly, the session has enlightened me in different ways. I feel like, you know, seeing things from different perspectives really helps. So thank you so much for an amazing session. All right, so um, the room is open for any questions. I see Feroz, you're raising your hands, so you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Although I joined halfway through the presentation, I wasn't quite sure what was going on, to be honest. I'm one of those most frequent participants of uh, educational webinar gem uh, webinars. And most of the times, they, uh, they, they have the topics related to ELT, like English language teaching. So I was wondering if uh, you could, uh, you could, you know, refer back from the in industry that you are uh, engaged with something to English teaching because mm -hmm. I always you know keep an eye on what's going on in ELT world and around so I would love to listen to some of your novel and innovative ideas related to English teaching specifically thank you well thank you for Rose for asking that question it's, it's really interesting um, that you know coming from an education point of view and, and being a teacher and how would you teach English to maybe someone in, in who studies architecture you know, who, and with architects, we're more visual and creative people. Um, so it might be something that, you know, it's not necessarily about sending a list of, of spellings to students. It might be through pictures or through more creative apps to help you engage. And I know Educational Webinar in Jam presents a lot of these creative ideas to engage with students. So um, I think it's more on the fact that we're more visual and uh, in, in our terms of communication with others, as opposed to someone who might be uh, maybe a coder, you know, they might be really good with maths, they might be really good with reading information and lines and processing that, um, as opposed to maybe someone who is just a student who's still learning. Uh, and so they don't, they've not been exposed to a work or professional environment yet. So they might not know certain topics or terms uh, and how to use them because they've not been able to have that experience yet. Uh, so I think mainly it comes back to being more creative and uh, thinking about how you could be more visual in, in teaching that language. All right. Thank you so much for your thank you. thorough answer and thank you for your question, Farouz. Uh, I thought we also have another question in the comment box from Abdelaziz. Uh, he's asking if, um, can you give an innovative idea that yourself managed to materialize in your own discipline? Yeah, I would say Pathos 101. <laughs> I've been encouraged recently by being moving to a new country, by realizing how things are completely different here and how they've been, uh, a lot of people who move here are underestimated when they move here because they're labeled as someone who's a newcomer as opposed to someone who's uh, already part of the society. And with that, that means I think there's a lot of potential in a lot of people. Uh, if you've been uh, given the opportunity to move to a new country, to find work there, to improve your life, you know, why is it that people uh, are set on a list that you're new here and so you're not relevant to the society currently? And I think that for me is just such a loss of talent that is being gathered on a, from a global platform. Uh, people all over the world from different industries and that's why I, I focus on the different industries is that people are coming from all walks of life um, different backgrounds different levels of education some typical uh, ways of uh, or formats of uh, understanding their field but also atypical ways of learning things um, so a lot of people are trying to stay within their field and trying to find ideas to to find a job in their industry but in the meantime is there something they can do to still help another industry? 
can they engage, for example, in a think tank to bring forward ideas while they're not necessarily uh, engaging in a workplace just now to bring their ideas forward, but maybe in theory, they'd be able to publish something, they'd be able to advertise an article that would then help them at their workplace or in someone else's workplace uh, to improve their systems or the way they're doing things or the way they're producing something. And so that's one of the things which I find is really important is taking taking on the global talent in any location and making sure that you're engaging with everyone and across all walks of life. All right, thank you so much, Abdel. We also have another question from uh, Zayn Zahir, uh, who's commenting on the session in general. Um, and they have a question about what are your thoughts on storytelling and what techniques can you share? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really interesting as well. It maybe comes back to the point with Rami about communication and engaging with someone. I think it all comes down to breaking down your idea in a thoughtful manner. So it doesn't necessarily start meaning like defining what things are. So if you're trying to present something to someone, you have to see, you know, how is it that you can bring that idea forward to someone who's not from the industry or the field? You know, if I'm trying to explain how does a credit card work without the finance and the tech of it, and you're trying to tell someone on a dinner table uh, who might be your grandparents, it might be your children, and telling them who, who have never studied about finance or, or tech, uh, you know, how does a credit card work? So what story would you go about telling them? Maybe one of the best examples I would say is if anyone has seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the movie, or read the book by Roald Dahl. Um, he explains how all his machines and uh, equipment work in his factory uh, by a very sort of storytelling method from going from point A to point B, how that chocolate first becomes syrup and then is turned and frozen into different shapes and then packaged a certain way before it's shipped out. So he just explains to a few little kids who come into his factory about how, how all his machine works. And it's not necessarily telling him the, the name of that machine or how fast that machine goes or how that uh, equipment is uh, bought or how much it's bought for or how it's sold or kept up. But it's more about telling how the process works. Mm -hmm. And and that in a in sort of tone and also vocabulary that everybody understands, as they say, the layman terms. You know, you don't have to explain something necessarily in, with all the professional words from your industry, but really how you would explain it to children or your grandparents. All right. Thank you so much, Abdel. Uh, I see here, Ruth, um, I think you have another question. So go ahead. And also, I would like to invite everybody, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have any kind of query, raise your hand open your mic, or you can simply write it in the chat box. Um, go ahead, Ruth. Oh, thank you very much. You know, um, I was able to catch uh, the, the remainder part of the presentation, and there was something about uh, a project that, that all people from all walks of life could, could be part of, right? So what could be some potential takeaways for English teachers, let's say, if I'm about to join that particular project? Yeah. Um, I think what you're most interested, in, uh, what I would think as a, as a way is how you communicate with students from different backgrounds. Um, so as a teacher, you're, you may have a class of 25, 30 kids um, at different age ranges. So either you're teaching high school, elementary, or at university level. Um, and each one of them, because English is such a universal language, they're just coming to learn a language, but not a specialty field. Um, so they're not trying to learn medicine from you or learn what architecture means or engineering topics, but just generally to learn the language. And with that, you're maybe one of the best parts of being engaged with someone from everyone across the world. And you're trying to get your ideas across to someone who may come from a creative background, but a scientific background as well, or even a tech background. And it's really interesting because you're directly engaging with the from a, an audience from a variety of industries and fields, maybe still students, but eventually they will be joining on the world to do different things um, and may go on to even teach as well. And so with that, you're pretty much exposed to, I would say, a big platform of audience that come from different backgrounds. And imagine trying to sell an idea to you 
uh, would be really interesting because you'd be seeing how you think your students would engage with that idea. So if it's something very techy and very um, sort of sophisticated and you want to break it down for an audience who doesn't fully understand English yet, so points of view that you want to spread this uh, app or option all the way across the world, you know, how would you do it? For example, if you look at an app like TikTok, um, you know, it, it's spread through students to kids uh, across the world and it has nothing to do with the fact that it's in one language, but everybody engages into it. And it's because it's very visual and creative. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting that you have all these different apps that are used across the world um, and not necessarily have to do anything with one field or one language, but you just get this audience, which is very diverse. Thank you, Burroughs. Thank you. Thank you, Afaf. Uh, all right, we have one more question and then we can wrap it up. Rambi, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Lamia. Uh, it's not a question as much as a, a thought that came to mind uh, when talking about language and storytelling and architecture or design in general, mm -hmm. and, and especially, um, and, and I relate to the point that Afaf made regarding the use of language, uh, words such as newcomer, uh, internationally trained architect, uh, and, and the use of words in, in, um, in the architectural field in a country like Canada. Is, is, is very tricky for two reasons. There are words that people want you to use and you don't understand the stigma of, and there are words that you are used to use and you really don't understand what they mean uh, in a different country. You might be using them in a way that fits and has been perfectly normal in a certain way in a different country, but when used here, they completely they mean a completely different thing. Uh, so I think that this is there, there's a very big potential in in what diverse discussions in platforms such as Pappas would bring in terms of bringing out such interesting um, language problems in a field such as an architecture, uh, and and once those problems are out in the light, someone working with language would be able to come up with a. a a way, and I find storytelling a very, um, a narratives, a very interesting ways of, of teaching people. So you could begin dissecting and, and, and exploring those words that someone comes with from their, from their previous country or those words that are used in that new country. You could present them in a way that is narrative uh, rich and tells a story that makes much, much more sense than that simple statement of use this word for such and such or don't use this word for such and such. So, so I believe that's one of the very interesting things that, and, and I think here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to also respond to a point that Farouz was making that this is one of the very interesting things about Pappas is it, it, once you have this platform and you're able to identify such problems, you, you might be able to come up with interesting ideas specifically through the, the, the lens of language. Oh, that's really interesting, Rami, and I completely agree. You know, um, English isn't my first language either. There are certain things that I think of in my language, which I can't fully translate into English, um, and which don't exist, also vice versa. There are some English words that, that don't exist in my language. You know, I can't translate, and, you know, maybe someone who's more versed with my language, like what toothpaste means in my language. You know, it's, it's a very universal object. Everybody uses it but I can't exactly specify what that means in my language or the word app, for example. If, you know, everybody uses the word app, it's a universal thing. And so maybe it comes back to the point that once you're able to identify these issues, and if you think back to an example of the traffic light, how can you make these things more universal so that everybody across the world could have it easily understood? And uh, it's, it's exactly that, which it makes it easier to then people who do move around or travel um, or even just step out of their city or country to be able to easily navigate the world and make things more efficient. And if I might add to that, uh, just a little thought that I have now is that even if you come from a different country and still use English, because English is a universal language, and uh, that same word that you have been using English word that you have been using for years could make could, could mean a completely different thing in a, in a different country. So 
I think universality alone is not the, the solution here because the, the language is universal and being used in different countries already, but the word means a different thing uh, because it, it is connected with, with, with different stories, with different events. So I, I, I don't believe unifying, or, or if I understand your point correctly, in terms of universality by u unification, maybe that's not the only way of doing that. Maybe actually identifying the, the different meanings behind each and every um, critical word and ac acknowledging the differences and making, building up an app or something that a story uh, or different stories uh, that that build up the meaning of that word in the do on the different diverse meanings of it in the different places yeah. would allow people to understand the universality in a more uh, diverse way. No, that's really interesting, Rami, and that's exactly where research and things like statistics come into play. So when you do propose an idea in a think tank, it doesn't just come from me and you discussing something for a couple of minutes, but it's backed by real research. And, and spending the time to do that then validates your idea or your thoughts a lot more. Uh, and I completely agree. But what's really interesting and fun is you're having a discussion now as an architect with someone who's a language teacher and discussing maybe the same point, but you're from completely different industries, how you could improve something in your industry and in architecture and make it uh, easier for architects to travel the world and understand the same thing, but at the same time, maybe how Perros can teach his students those kind of things as well. So I uh, really appreciate your point of view, Rami. Thank you so much for all your questions and grades. Um, time is up. It's sad to say goodbye, but um, I just want to congratulate you again, uh, Atha, for launch the launch of Pathos, and I can't wait till I use my free session, and everybody can, okay, if you scan the QR code, and also find them on LinkedIn, anybody who attended the session, um, as far as I understood, uh, can have Session. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look forward to chatting with every one of you. Uh, please, you know, bring it forward. I, I'd be happy to set a time and have a one one chat about your ideas and concept. And the most important thing for me is that it is your concept and your ideas. Uh, and we're just empowering you to bring that forward and process it and see how it could be brought forward into a real world. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atat, and thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody who attended. Please make sure that uh, you, you know, sign in the link so that you can receive your certificate after the session. Uh, there is a link in the chat box. Please make sure you register there. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. See you next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, and wishing you all the very best. Thank you.